All right, so hey everyone, this is the SIGAUTH meeting for September 11, 2024. I think we have a pretty light agenda, so hopefully we can get through it quickly. Um, I had one announcement that I put in there a while ago, which is that I think we are being forcibly migrated to a Kubernetes IO owned mailing list. Uh, so that we don't we don't really have a choice there. Um, so yeah, I guess if folks want to join the group, it would be good. I will probably try to migrate all the old members if possible. Uh, I haven't really figured that out yet. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think the the rationale is, of course, uh, that we uh, there's no limits on our our groups um, because the other Google group was a public Google group. It has very strict limits on uh, how, like how much traffic you can generate against it. And there's no getting around that. Um, so I think we are kind of stuck, which is a little unfortunate. But uh, otherwise, I guess, Anish, you have the topic on the agenda. Uh, yes. Um, Jordan is not here, but uh, most of the discussion that we've been having on the PR is with Jordan and Mo. Um, um, but on a very high level, uh, basically, uh, we have been trying to add uh, additional metrics uh, in the structured authentication configuration feature, um, which supports JOT authenticators today. Uh, and this specific PR is basically to provide more visibility to the end user on when the JOX endpoint uh, was uh, reached from the OIDC provider in the uh, API server. And then also to provide more visibility around the timestamp of uh, when the request was made, and then if the request was successful, if it was a failure to the JOX endpoint, um, and then also maybe to let the user know that the key set has changed. So in that way, if they're actually making uh, changes to their uh, uh, the key set, then they can basically observe that through the metrics from the API server. Um, so adding the metrics was pretty straightforward. We were able to do that with the custom HTTP client and all of that, right? Uh, and then the main question here is today we support um, automatic reload of the structured authentication configuration file. So that means if you go and update the file on the file system, the API server will automatically pick it up and then it will configure the new OIDC providers. And if all the new configured authenticators are healthy, then we would basically stop the old ones and then remove it. And as part of this and also providing metrics, we want to make sure that the metrics don't keep growing unbounded. So when the new set of authenticators are being configured, the goal for us to is to go and reset the metrics that were configured in the previous version of the authentication configuration. Um, and we have been looking at ways to do it. Like, I think the simple way that we came up in this PR was once the new authenticators are healthy, we would just reset everything and then let the new authenticators repopulate the metrics. But there is a very subtle race condition there where the, we might lose relevant metrics for the new authenticator. Um, and based on this long thread of discussion, I think towards the end, the, we, what we reached at is we could use some kind of generation or we could use the hash of the authentication config, like a uh, spring down version, so that we can uniquely identify metrics and map them to like a version of the authentication configuration. And once the reload is done, we can easily just reset the metrics that belong to a particular generation or the older version of the hash. Um, so that is what we came to towards the end. In that discussion, uh, there was no final decision. So I wanted to bring that up to this group to see if we can do something better or if doing the generation or the hash approach seems like a viable option. If you're resetting metrics, um, you may be able to use a custom collector to instead determine which streams you need to export at at collection time. Um, so that, I guess, would prevent the case of you causing issues for the 
like Prometheus or whatever, collecting your metrics. But you you would still need some kind of logic to know which metrics to throw away, right? Internally, otherwise you would just technically No, so typically the way that works is like every time Prometheus scrapes, you will get a callback and you determine which streams you export. So there's no throwing away, right? It's just you look at the current state and you decide, oh, okay, I'm going to export these five streams based on these labels, mm -hmm. and you report them. Right. I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, so say you first started with, like, issuer one and two, and then you went to issuer three and four. If Prometheus collects metrics when you're at issuer three and four, you obviously don't want to report one and two anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that would mean that you would have to somehow know that you were done with one and two. Right? And you would, wouldn't you know that by them no longer appearing in the most recent version of the config? Maybe I'm misunderstanding what's, what's happening. Um, like, yeah, like, so yes, in the sense that, so I, I think what you're saying is if you track this in the way you described, a custom collector would probably make it easier in resetting metrics. So instead of having a race condition on resetting metrics, we should instead explicitly track which one we care about, report those, and basically every time, perhaps on a lazy collection call, like every time we're called, we would say, okay, cool. Here's all my metrics. Which ones do I need to go ahead and discard now because those issues don't exist anymore? And here's the final state. Here you go, collector. Right? I think that could work. When you have a custom collector, there's no discarding. Like you, you don't have any retained state. I mean, you could, but the, no, there's nothing about the custom collector interface that. Right. Well, I mean, uh, somewhere we would have to retain the state of. Uh, I still care about this issue, right? So I think one is sure. you would don't want you you want to like discard the old ones right so if, if the first version of authentication configures issuer one issuer two and then the second version of it has issuer two and issuer three right like i think it it's simple to say yes uh, when the next time the collector scrapes it would take issuer three's metrics because that's relevant but in issuer two we still want to remove the metrics from the v1 of issuer two like when the jocks endpoint was fetched and all of that, because that's no longer relevant here. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is some of that oddity as well. Um, I think some of the other stuff we were struggling with is is all of the metrics tend to be global, and that resists dynamic change pretty pretty heavily. Effectively, is what that comes down to is. Let me see if I can cut out some. So, like, I just did this um, for a internal query patch for external token signing. Ah. So, um, where we're reporting uh, uh, key IDs, right? Like, we have a set of key IDs, and we have the same problem of how do we stop exporting streams for old key IDs? We and the custom collector solved it. Pretty okay. Well. So, let me see if I can cut out the code, and I can maybe post it in Slack and that might give you some inspiration. Okay. <clears throat> now I'm curious. And so now you're telling me GK is also carrying a patch. So you've joined the EKS club, I guess. Uh, we carry lots of patches. We don't like it. <laughs> that's fine. Part of the managed service gig, I guess. Um, okay, cool. So uh okay so i think to here uh to share some code uh, regarding a uh, custom collector uh that would make it easier to avoid okay so if um if that's the, let's assume that's practical and pragmatic to implement. I think that would be the approach we would probably take uh, because it would probably give you the 
most specific set of data, I guess. Um, okay. um, so I, I think that's fine. So let, let's just explore that, uh, Anish. And then if that doesn't work, we'll just, uh, we'll come back again and say it didn't work. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, okay. Any, David or anyone else, did anyone else have any comments on this first topic before we move to the other topic? Yeah, I don't know enough to intelligently comment. I'm hoping to hear that's everything right. Okay. Excellent. That's fine. Uh, awesome. All uh, right. Uh, I don't want to butcher your name. Uh, so yeah. You... Emiliano. <laughs> Hello, guys. Nice uh, to meet you. Hi, pleasure. Um, welcome. Uh, so yeah, did you want to, I think you had asked a question in Slack and then I think you would want to yeah. ask some opinions from folks. Yeah, it's, I can repeat it. Uh, so can I share my screen here? Uh, let me make you co-host so you can. Okay. Um, it's going to be better you can, if I can show you the diagram. Okay. And let me preparing, I think, and now you should be good. All right, share screen, window, this one, share. Hi. Can you see it now? All right, awesome. So I have this situation. Um, I have a couple of customers with a private cluster, with a private uh, a, uh, IP for the API. And currently, um, we are connecting through kubectl uh, uh, through a proxy. This proxy is an HTTP without TLS. But inside the connection, there is a TLS tunnel. Uh, we have a firewall, uh, so it's only accepting a set of IPs. The problem that uh, we are facing is that um, whenever we have a customer or a user that it's not in this ACL, uh, we need to add it, all right? And we have no uh, authentication mechanism here, all right? So. Uh, basically, the, the Kubernetes, it's uh, integrated with an OpenID um, uh, server, you know, connector. Um, so it's fetching the ID token uh, correctly. Um, so, you know, this proxy basically uh, uh, prevents having this uh, API uh, directly connected to the internet. So my goal here is to have this firewall removed and be able to connect to the API through a proxy doing an authentication of the token in the proxy. All right? Uh, that's, the, that's the problem I'm facing. So for this, I, I have thought of different options. Um, so the first one is, you know, basically the one that it's, you know, the most natural it would be to authenticate the bearer token uh, in the proxy when w as soon as the user tries to uh, open the tunnel. So basically, that would mean adding this uh, header, this proxy authorization header. I found there's an R RFC from the IETF also for this. Um, so the idea here would be that um, the um, cube config. Uh, maintains the server uh, API, you know, the domain, the uh, FQDN of the server, also the certificate of the certificate authority, um, but it uses the uh, um, proxy URL in the kubeconfig. The problem here is that this doesn't exist currently, you know. The, the possibility of adding this header uh, as part of the OIDC um, Plugin, it's not, it's not there. So this is like the the cleanest way I found, um, but obviously this is not yet supported. The alternative I have, if I cannot, you know, add this to the uh, to the header uh, of the connect command to the proxy, is um, having uh, to inspect the whole package. I mean, terminating the TLS connection in the proxy fetching this uh, token and establishing the TLS connection to the API again, all right? So, I mean, this, it can be done. Uh, basically, uh, you can code it uh, from scratch or you can even use Nginx with, uh, custom, um, with custom code like Lua code and so on. But the problem I see here basically is, um, you know, um, 
you are mingling with the TLS traffic. And I'm, I'm not worried um, for like, you know, standard commands of apply and get and so on, but especially about WebSockets and all the exec or logs commands of kubectl. So I'm, you know, I'm deciding uh, how to, maybe there is another way I didn't, I, I'm not seeing, you know? So if you have any ideas or recommendation, that would be awesome. I had a question. So in this picture, would you expect the bearer token used to authenticate to the proxy to be different than the bearer token used to authenticate to the Hube API server? Um, well, initially, not initially, because um, basically if we are using the same issuer, that could be, you know, the same token. But at least I want to avoid, you know, propagating this request here if I, if already this token it's not uh, valid. So you're going to have one proxy per Cube API server. They're going to be exactly, they're going to use the same issuer. So you would expect to receive the same tokens. Yeah, I mean, initially I'm, I'm thinking about having this uh, proxy uh, installed in the cluster, you know, and having its own uh, load balancer or even maybe in a virtual machine, you know, next in the, connected to the, to the private network. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could have another uh, ID token here if you want, you know, if, if you are using like different uh, issuers. But initially to simplify things, <laughs> for me, it's, uh, it's the same issuer, it's the same token. So the same token that the OIDC plugin uh, obtains uh, when kubectl uh, Cube is executed, Apart from uh, using it on the authorization header, it should also be inserted into the uh, proxy header. I don't know if it makes sense. Huh? I mean, this is the way I found to avoid um, touching, you know, the the TLS uh, traffic between the the client and the and the API. Uh, so I. I don't remember off the top of my head if connect proxies work correctly with cube. Like, do they always for all types of network requests? Like, do they work for the upgrade requests and all of those things? Currently, I mean, I'm I'm using it uh, for everything. I mean, I I I didn't find I haven't found find you know like a command that I, I can execute that I cannot execute with this proxy. Okay. Like exec, I can log in uh, to containers terminal shells. So I can see logs, um, and I can execute all of the other typical, you know, cube cuttle commands. Okay. Uh, I assume that's because it's basically a tunnel within a tunnel. Exactly, because I'm not mingling with this. You know, this is transparent for the for the API. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess what you're trying to do with kubectl, I, I don't think I've seen done. The the TLS terminating proxy I've seen done many times. Uh, you are correct. You do take full ownership of effectively understanding all of the requests. Um, if it helps, there are multiple products that are in existence that like commercial products that kind of help with these types of things that you could probably explore um, and see if they, like, I don't think you should implement a new one. Yeah. I think it would be better to use an existing one. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of the rationale I've seen people for implementing their own is they end up wanting to do more than just authentication. Um, yeah. Like some, some of the stuff I've seen is as granular as like, I want to have audit logs for every character someone types into an exec command, yeah. uh, which obviously requires interception and interpretation of the request stream, right? Um, so I think that's why people don't tend to do or haven't really tried necessarily to push. Um, obviously the other alternative altogether is, um, uh, and this depends, I, I don't know anything about your 
clients and and I mean in the human word like the people using kubectl yeah 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 um if they would be open to running any of like the various mesh networks that are available um that do support the ability to put like cube like the API server on a mesh network and so you can still have your regular authentication it's just that you're like pre-networked and effectively like a VPN okay uh, so I think those are choices too but I think you're going to have a hard time with the proxy auth authorization because like effectively one, it would end up being a cap. You would be trying to change kubectl and we would have to somehow define it in a way that works with all of the existing mechanisms, right? So like there's at least three different existing mechanisms for getting tokens to kubectl today, um, some static yeah. some dynamic. I... I suspect that we couldn't just say that, oh, it's always going to be the same token because it, I suspect in many cases, the proxy and the API server need different tokens. And so then you end up having to like duplicate that entire stack um, or at least reuse it in weird ways. So I, I don't think that's probably going to be a great sell, M mostly just because of the amount of code complexity that would probably add. Um, yeah, I, I saw you know that there are some, there is an issue about adding uh, custom headers uh, to to cube uh, cube CTL, you know on on this end you know the possibility there's an issue i.e. people saying that they actually uh, the proxy the authenticating proxy is mentioned on that on that issue um, so basically that's adding you know headers here um, what I what I think is that uh, you know, you have the option of adding a proxy uh, on kubeconfig currently. You can, you know, add proxy URL. Um, but I, I think this is this should be a, I mean, I don't know if it's possible, but I really see it, you know, as part of the OIDC uh, plugin, uh, like an option there saying, okay, not only complete the authorization header, but also the proxy authorization header if a proxy URL is set. I don't know if it makes sense, you know, but... Uh, in I, I don't think that makes sense because there's nothing in the OIDC spec along those lines, as far as I'm aware. Now, if you can point me to something in the OIDC spec, then sure, we could do that. Uh, but those are effectively unrelated RFCs that don't have anything to do with each other. Well, one's an IETF draft and the other one is an RFC. But either way, like I don't think they're related to each other. They, oh, okay. they happen to be built on headers, but I'm pretty sure they're separated by like 10 years plus of uh, yeah. all right um so and your recommendation yeah uh, sorry I, I said again i don't think in most deployments where you have an authenticating proxy does it want to even use the same token as api server i think they're like completely detached and unrelated um in your deployment they're the same but i think that's just because you happen to own the proxy and you're just making a match um but I don't think that would work. And I, I think the other issue I would have with like maybe trying to support this is I suspect what people would ask for is just give me a new field in cube config that lets me set the value. And there's nothing hard about that and there's nothing technically wrong about it, but it just encourages people to use long live static secrets in cube configs. Uh, yeah. It worked very hard to get away from. And I don't think I want to add a new one to let you do that. Okay. Okay, understood. So your recommendation is to work on this uh, scenario, saying, uh, oh, I don't know, evaluate uh, a product, an existing product, to do this, basically. Uh, I mean, that, that, I mean, that is unfortunately what I would probably say. Um, uh, well, I think my top recommendation would be some kind of VPN mesh network solution, right? Something that doesn't require TLS termination and is transparent to the clients and the server. That would be ideal. Right. Um, if you can't do that for reasons of your environment, then I think the TLS terminating proxy is your best choice. And a few do exist today that you could try to leverage. Um, but I guess with that said, oh. I, I mean, there's a bunch of other people on this call. Somebody else might have opinions. Awesome. Um, I do think it's a little bit strange to have your proxy. Like if you wanted to set up a proxy authorization, um, it seems strange to me that you would say, yeah, let's have it be the same. Um, 
if there was a way to do that that didn't put a long lived token into a cube config you know i have experimented with something like this about 8 years ago i made it work it wasn't the easiest thing in the world uh i wouldn't expect adding that to the cube config to be fast so I would also suggest pull someone off the shelf that does what you want. All right, awesome. So if, if do you think that on this configuration, like all the commands, they work correctly? There is uh, no issue with the uh, TLS being, you know, terminated here. I mean, for exec for uh, logs and so on. Uh, I mean, I have written one such proxy. And it does have tests proving that all of those things work. So it is okay. technically possible. It is not easy or convenient, but it is technically possible. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not saying I would recommend it, but if if you are in the situation where uh, okay. you want to do something at that layer, well, that that's generally the choice. Um, but yeah, I, I've I've also seen it done. Um, I've seen it done with HA proxy. I've seen it done with Envoy. I've seen it done with custom dedicated proxies. Um, yeah. Okay. I will explore the other alternative that you mentioned about the service mesh. Maybe that's the the way to go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. No problem. Um, okay. Uh, I guess I can. Well, there was, I don't think there was anything else on the agenda. Let me go back real quick. I'm not sharing my screen yet. Okay, no one has added an item. Uh, so unless someone wants to add an item right now, I think we can just call it um, and give people half an hour back. Anything? Um, otherwise, uh, I can't actually remember off the top of my head when Kep freezes, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's coming. Uh, David, when's PRR freeze, you know? Early October. Early October. OK, so you have like th less than three weeks probably to have everything ready that you want in 132 to get reviewed, basically. Uh, so yeah, cool. OK, I think we can leave it there. Uh, and we'll see everyone in two weeks. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.